at NewFest, we tell queer stories and support and provide a platform for queer storytellers and create moments for connection. saw myself with a narrative. The power to see even queer storytelling and queer motion uh, all over the world is what connects us. And I think that's why it's really crucial that these films exist. Greetings and thanks for joining us for All in the Queer Family, featuring Circus of Books director Rachel Mason in conversation with Joey Soloway. My name is Nick McCarthy and I'm the director of programming at NewFest. NewFest is New York's leading LGBTQ film and media organization. Uh, you may know us best for our annual film festival, which we host and produce every October. Uh, we also host and produce events year round. Uh, so to you know, learn more about all of our upcoming events and to consider becoming a member, please visit newfest.org. Um, we were delighted to celebrate Rachel and Circus of Books back in April, um, and actually one of our first virtual events uh, after the pandemic hit. Um, so it's a delight to welcome her back as Circus of Books was recently named as one of the best films of the year by IndieWire. Um, and it continues to amass some Oscar buzz around it too. Um, we're so excited to host these brilliant minds in conversation to discuss um, both their work, both Rachel and Joey, um, as well as the process of featuring LGBTQ families on screen through an autobiographical lens. Um, we'd also love to thank our friends at PFLAG for the work that they do to support LGBTQ families and for partnering on this conversation this evening. Uh, we'd also like to thank Film Fatales, JQ International, and IDA for their help and support in spreading the word for this conversation. So please join me in welcoming our two guests for this one-on-one -on -one conversation. Rachel Mason and Joey Salawa. Hey there. Hey. Yeah. Hi. This is I'd love to awesome. a bit of words and uh, about their backgrounds too before um, we go into conversation. So first we have Rachel Mason. Uh, Rachel Mason is an Emmy Award nominated Los Angeles based filmmaker with an extensive background in visual art and music. In 2019, Rachel Mason was featured as one of IndieWire's 25 LGBTQ filmmakers on the rise and she recently directed and received an Emmy nomination for the Netflix original documentary, Circus of Books, which was executive produced by Ryan Murphy. Um, the film details her biographical story, growing up in the child of pornogra uh, pornography shop at the center of the gay community. Um, so welcome, Rachel. Thanks. And of course, Joey Soloway. Uh, Joey is the Emmy and Peabody award-winning creator of the groundbreaking Amazon series, Transparent, a poignant comedy that artfully explores identity, love, sex, God, and boundaries through the lives of a complicated American family. Okay. Other contributions to American, Jewish, feminist, and trans culture um, from Joey include the critically acclaimed Amazon series, I Love Dick, as well as Six Feet Under, United States of Tara, and their first feature film, Afternoon Delight, which won the directing award at Sundance in 2013. Um, I, for one, am so excited to hear this conversation with these two brilliant minds, so I will let you two take it from here, and we're so excited to host y'all. Great. Hi. Hey again. Last hey, time we went out was pre-pandemic pre or early pandemic. Early wasn't pandemic. It? It was we were early. social distanced. Yeah. Wow. Really good yeah. to see you. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this, Joey. Oh. Oh my God, I'm so happy to do it. And I'm so happy to just be supporting you as we head into the awards industrial complex <laughs> as a filmmaker, which you're just like really experiencing the pandemic version, right? So that must be yeah. kind of weird. Well, it's the most amazing thing and that I love it. And it makes sense in a weird way for Circus of Books because we're the underdog of all underdogs in terms of just everything film and you know we managed to kind of climb our way into the scene where here we are you know being celebrated and I think what's so cool and weird is that the sort of Hollywood Oscars rule book that I was sort of unaware of anyway because I come out of more of the art world and music scene I'm like oh all those rules don't apply anymore and so the, the little guy can be as powerful and supported as sort of the big 
um, you know, the big industry players. And, and I'm always the person that's like, awesome, cool. Let's, you know, let's all fight together and be, you know, it, it sort of replicates, I would say, the experience of the queer community hmm. you know, being able to stand up for itself and create its own world. So I, I, in a strange way, I enjoy being, uh, you know, I'm almost like suddenly aware that here we are and we're in contention for these really high honors that I didn't really yeah. set out to achieve, but it, it just feels like it's happening because there's been so much support. Amazing. Yeah. You guys deserve it all. You deserve all of that. It makes me very excited when I imagine somebody like you winning an Oscar and, and you being seen for your work as a filmmaker, your family being seen, Circus of Books being seen, this queer story, this queer family. You know, what has it been like for you? I'm just curious over the past year, because when I saw you, it was kind of had kind of had just come out, right? And so now it's like out and people know your work and they know about your family and they know, you know, what has it been like sharing the story of, of this of this movie with the world for you? Well, you know, it's really interesting because I think one of the things I got to do that I, I really feel terrible for so many other filmmakers, they didn't get to have a film festival run. And yeah. so I traveled with the film all over the world and saw it, you know, up close and personal affecting audiences in like yeah. Ecuador and, and places yeah. where, you know, people were coming up to me and talking to me about how you know, they saw their mom in my mom. And, and, you know, I feel that sense right now that as soon as the film came out and was on Netflix, uh, I got messages from so many places, from people in, in parts of the world where, you know, they flat out said, you know, I can't be gay here in Indonesia or in Iran. And I've seen the film and I just really appreciate it. And it gave me the sense that um, the fight that we've had in the United States that has been so hard won is just not, has not even started in so many parts yeah. of the world. But yeah, as far as my parents, you know, now they are spotted even in their masks, you know, at Smart and Final or wherever they go. Well, they're supposed to not go anywhere, which has been really funny. Um, and I think my mom is always the most panicked about the Jewish community realizing what she's done. It's been the, um, you know, the the biggest secret she's kept in a, in a strange way from the, the scary concern. Well, actually, yeah, so that must, there must have been some occurrences of people at her shul who saw the movie. Well, funny enough, they switched to a reform synagogue <laughs> in the last few years. And I do have to say, I mean, the conservative movement has come around to being more LGBT friendly. I mean, it was really in a, in a not good place, I would say, during you know, the years that my film chronicles, which is actually the reason that I wanted to chronicle mm. that period. Um, but, you know, I think culturally, thankfully, we've evolved. And that's, you know, I, I that's one of the things I related the most to, I think, in Transparent, actually, was that it was a, a Jewish family story in, in some way. It was like, the I was sitting with one watching it. I was like, wow, I just, I want to see this drama unfold because, being Jewish is so fundamental to so many of the last decades of my life, just on a sort of undercurrent level um, in thinking about queerness. Um, tell, always, tell me more about that. How do you, where, where are your like crossovers of Jewish and queer? Well, you know, initially it was, I mean, I grew up in a really conservative synagogue and I just hated the whole thing because it was, it was culturally conservative, you know, men on one side, women on the other, and the kind of um, divide uh, that really, I, I just fundamentally opposed in the like core of my being. And then I had, I had friends who went to reform synagogues. So I would go to their bar mitzvahs and I'd be like, Oh my God, this is so cool. Why can't we go here? You know, my mom would just be like, well, cause that's not real Judaism. <laughs> they're not that's not the true rabbinic you know there there's not enough hebrew in that synagogue so I, I i just always um i had a feeling that i was very oppositional to the jewishness that i was given mm. but that i saw a glimmer of something cool over there that was like possible for me to join but because i was so um personally offended by what i felt was homophobic sexist you know, blatant discriminatory, um, you know, vile kind of stuff in this, in the really stodgy world of, of the conservative movement that I grew up in. I didn't like it. <laughs> and I kind of rejected Judaism uh, 
all across the board, but I understood that I am culturally Jewish. So that, that was sort of for me, the schism, um, because I, I recognize how have you like woven those together in the recent past? Well, in some ways, I think I've woven them together because I, I really now identified that there's a movement within Judaism that I'm totally into, which is the conservative movement. And I actually have a synagogue that I really like and, you know, queer rabbis are Wait, the conservative point. movement you said no i'm sorry reform movement a I reform mean, movement uh, great okay so you found a queer rabbi that you like yeah i mm-hmm. love so J- rabbi josie hudson is the oh yeah rabbi I know. Right she's amazing. yeah you cool. know her yeah well my kid my my kids oh right right, right. of course temple temple yeah. Israel, yeah no yeah. no temple israel was like you know and for me it was frustrating I'm like wait temple israel is right around the corner why don't we go there? you know and also um uh, I love also Rabbi Denise Egger at uh, Kolami, who's another out and proud lesbian rabbi who's also just, you know, doing great things in the reform movement. So I think that was the other piece of it. You know, and my partner goes to the synagogue with me. He loves it. Or I guess nobody uh, goes to synagogue anymore. But we went. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Buck would come with me all the time and just like, oh, my God, this place is so cool. Like, And so, was- like, really, it seems like that the the film's kind of promotion and you and Buck meeting and falling in love kind of coincided, right? It's all been one big. Yeah. (laughs) That is part of it. Tell me and tell the rabid fans listening a little bit or as much as you want to about it. No, totally. Um, Well, no, and actually Buck has the most amazing fan base um, because it's the most interesting people who, who uh, follow him. So, so for sure they're um, really intrigued by our situation, you know, it's fascinating to me in some ways, because I think maybe this is where you and I can also intersect because I never really was that closely connected, I would say on a personal level to the trans world and trans dialogue. And now it's pretty much my daily life, <laughs> literally every single day, we're, we're discussing things that are so uh, constant. I mean, it's, it's an evolving just constant dialogue. And it, there's so much to discuss that is constant in the world. And I realized now I was, I was much more in just a, I guess a general queer space and, you know, on a personal level, um, I have for many years identified as bisexual and just didn't exactly, I don't know. I never, I never had any big giant dialogue that was constant, but with Buck and his activism, there's just this constant, like, effort to really think about major, major issues in the trans space. And I do think it's because it's, you know, a newer public than it's ever been, Mm -hmm. but um, it totally coincides with Circus of Books, the release of it in the last year. And I think what's been interesting for me is that, um, you know, I would say that the, the LGBT acronym even wasn't the original acronym for the store the store was just a gay and really gay male space so the world of circus of books was very gay male focused and you know when i grew up in la um you know i would sort of move around between different queer worlds and i would go to like a you know a lesbian bar or you know go to a place that was really um you know a specifically queer space but you know they, they were divided in in more specific ways back in the old days. So I look at Circus of Books as a relic of the past. And in some ways, Buck has reminded me of the time when he was a lesbian back in the day. And that was like this total world unto itself, you know, the specific lesbian spaces. And those have also come out of existence. And so, yeah, so I feel like we're in a whole new world of exploration of the LGBT acronym, LGBTQIA, and it's very digital. It's very much online. And um, I think what I did with Circus of Books was really like race after some bit of that history before it could all get swept away. I mean, my parents yeah. were so beautiful. Mm-hmm. beautiful. I'm so glad that you did. I'm so glad that you did. That um, obviously I'm, you know, for years walked past there, in there, near there, around there, Sunset Junction, you know, it yeah. was the center of a certain thing, sort of really be, and I would go in sometimes and read books, but I really didn't know anything about your family. I didn't know anything about your parents. If they were there, I didn't see them. There were, I had no conception that I was like in a Jewish space. You know? <laughs> well, but, nobody um, did. That's the funny thing. <laughs> yeah, but that, I think that's kind of cool. I'm gonna, I want to switch gears though and ask you a little bit more about filmmaking, mm. because I think so many people are really curious about exactly this place where you are, you know, where you, 
you really made your first film, you found yourself as a filmmaker and also encountered Ryan Murphy and Netflix and this larger world of streaming, it all kind of must have been quite an education. Like I would love to hear, um, I guess we can talk about filmmaking afterwards because I am really curious about what you learned about using the camera and what you want to do next with filmmaking. But I think um, just to take people through how Ryan came aboard and what it's been like to have Netflix as a as a partner in culture making. I'm so curious. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for those amazing questions. Because I, I do think that's kind of, well, I will say one thing about where I came from. Most people don't realize, but Circus of Books is actually my second film. And it's because my first one was an art house musical feature film. It was called The Lives of Hamilton Fish. And it was this really right. personal, weird exploration. Yeah. And it, people who are like, I guess deep Rachel Mason fans knew about that film. And I guess my highlight of my, my life in that world was somebody came up to me at the YMCA once and was like, I saw the lives of Hamilton fish. So I have this one film that's a total culty, weird art house movie, but I performed it with um, just an actual soundtrack that I sang on stages. And it was a, you know, and so I will say while I was working on Circus of Books, I'd also been working on this musical sci fi project that you know all about called The End Stage of Stars. And so I have always had my head in a narrative, very artistic space. I would say, you know, maybe somebody like, Alejandro Hodorowski or, you know, to, to throw out the more contemporary example, maybe like David Lynch, sort of a, an artsy, an art house filmmaker that can cross into several territories. Like that's my aspiration. And mm. Circus of Books was going to be the film that I did along the way to like getting my next big project done. And it was going to be the film that, you know, the, the one archives would hopefully fall in love with. And mm. so that was what I was really excited for and thinking like, okay, this is going to be a true like super gay academic movie that, you know, some people in the gay community might love. <laughs> and if anyone had told me that, no, the world's going to find it and it's going to be on Netflix and, and that will lead you down a whole new path uh, where now you're speaking with Joey Soloway. Uh, I, I just don't know if I would have even believed that because Circus of Books was such a niche underground story and store concept. So it goes to show you can't really predict anything in this life, but um, getting Ryan involved was so also circumstantial. Um, I've been working on the film for like three or four years, just really in this deep isolation. And by the time it was pretty much done and edited and about ready to, sh to show at Tribeca, my sales agent said, Rachel, I, I finally got in touch with Ryan Murphy. He really wants to see it. And, and, and then he sent it to Ryan and then, um, and then Ryan loved it. And we met at, uh, at Netflix headquarters. And I, I don't know if you, well, of course, you know, the feeling of like being almost done with your film, you have to do color grading, you have to get it soundproof and you still don't have $20,000 to finish it. And it's due in three days. Mm -hmm. So that was where my head was when I met Ryan. And I remember thinking like, okay, I know this guy is powerful, but, um, I need to finish this film. Like I don't actually have any time to even do meetings. I was panicked. I met Ryan and I'm, I, I, you know, he was asking me all these questions and I, I think I didn't understand the depth of his power and his like, you know, wizard of Oz, Ozness and the fact that, you know, every other billboard on sunset is a Ryan Murphy project. So I just was like, okay, hi, great to meet you. I'm trying to finish this film. Um, what do you want? You know, how are we going to do this? And, you know, it was this kind of funny meeting where um, he actually said to me, he's like, you know, that store, was there for me when I was a young gay man in LA okay. in like the 1980s and there was no place to go. And I didn't even know, you know, what this could mean to be gay. And he really gave me the same speech that I had heard countless gay men give me. And it was one of those moments where I'm like, wow, the store was just there for these people. I mean, he was like, I, you know, I was a 20 year old guy and like, it was so, it was so helpful. You know, it was like therapeutic to find porn. And what he said was just this profound statement. And, and in a way he was able to actually do something about it. Say, you know, I love this story so much because, you know, I think Ryan also had a really religious family Catholic. Mm -hmm. So he just loves that sort of schism in families. And he, he, he fell in love with all the details of the different elements of the story. And I thought that was cool. Um, and I didn't have any sense of like, wow, okay, Ryan thinking it's cool means 
you get to have a Netflix deal and all these different things start flowing from there. Yeah. Um, so his, um, his stamp on the film led to it, you know, being able to have, I think the kind of life that it's had mm. on Netflix. So when you met him, it wasn't like Ryan wants to be the EP. It was like, Hey, this guy wants to meet you. Well, yeah, no, I mean, it, it could have. So the thing I was trying to say is it easily could have been Ryan wants to EP it. He wants all these things, but I was so deep in the headspace of not thinking about anything business that I was like unable to process all of it. I just was like on autopilot because oh. the film was literally due in two days after having worked on it. And I remember saying, okay, well, I, I'm happy. I want him to be in the credits. Like, let's figure this out. Mm. We have three options, a random box or a, poppers box or a magazine which which one does he want we we, we can insert it in here and yeah. i remember writing my graphic realized what was what the yeah the change the movie totally i didn't i thought it would be amazing to have his name on it and how cool is that but i didn't understand the depth of his support yeah yeah it's so interesting yeah i love hearing all the inside stories um and then yeah let's talk about your life as a filmmaker a little bit and also you know, what's next for you? I think about um, your Hamilton Fish project and I think about Circus of Books and think about, you know, the journey from just being sort of an art filmmaker to mm -hmm. then, you know, really needing to think about story. You know, I know along with Catherine Robson, who of course I love and she's editing a very personal documentary for me as well. So we have that in common. But, That's our um, editor. My editor is Catherine who... Um, just, yeah, I will say Catherine actually, I think gave me the like crash course in narrative working with Catherine, my editor slash writer. Helped yeah, me. yeah. You guys share story credit too, right? Writing totally, credit. Because it was like, I couldn't see the forest for the trees. And I knew I had all these different scenes that I loved. And I also had a really great producer starting with me on the whole thing, Cynthia Childs, who actually came out of reality TV. So oh in an interesting way, I think I had this mix of like a great academic actual, like Catherine has an academic background her sort of um, and her interest in porn was academic. And that's how I met her. I found out that she got a uh, like a PhD in a porn here. She yeah. wrote a dissertation yeah. on porn because I remember I was looking for an editor that had a porn background and I, I was struggling with this. And I just randomly talked to my friend Vanessa Mayer, who was like, I can recommend you an editor who I know studied porn. Perfect. Yeah. yeah she's and then Catherine perfect. turned into, you know, a, tell me a what did you learn? What did you learn about storytelling? So, you know, it was interesting because I had not wrapped my head around the story arc and also the fact that this is my family story. So I didn't have a good grasp on various puzzle pieces that could make the story, you know, sing as a film. It was it was sort of too wrapped up in my own life. Um, although I know that I'm talking to someone that knows exactly how to figure that out. So for me, though, having not worked in, you know, scripted series or doing anything in that capacity, I always was visual. And this is really where for me, leaning into visual imagery has always been in a way my narrative focus. So like even certain scenes that are in the film might not mean that much to other people. But like when my mom was throwing out all of those DVDs, I just felt okay, like hold on that shot of the DVDs in the dumpster. Cause to me, I was like crying watching that. Like that is so poignant. These are these guys, like, you know, she doesn't have any feeling for them. And so I just knew there was power in these shots and these moments. Mm. And, and, you know, also like when I met Larry Flint, for me, there was this um, element of like, wow, I'm actually meeting the guy who started it all. And, and when he was talking about my parents, he kept saying, you know, Rachel, your parents, um, this and that they were the first people to sell hustler and I didn't know that so there was moments in the film that um, I, I just recognized while it was happening like okay this is singular this is really powerful and this is the story but then it was really Catherine helping me figure out okay well, where does it land and, and what are the music cues that lead it to have the impact when it lands here or here or here oh. and I think that's the you know the trifecta of narrative with editing and you know, great storytelling that all comes together. Um, yeah. And so when you say, like I said, what, you know, I said, what if we linger on the, on these, um, you know, this picture in the dumpster, I guess 
as a filmmaker, I just want to know technically you're standing there next to your DP who's shooting the dumpster or were you holding the camera or were you watching? I mean, how, how do you yeah. direct documentary? So some of the shots that are like, like <laughs> the one that, pe the, the one that gets a lot of press cause it's really funny is my mom uh, asking her, uh, you know, her worker named Jorge, who's been, he's practically in the family. Um, you know, Jorge, is this a white guy? And, you know, she, she, I was shooting that scene myself with a small point and shoot camera. And there were a lot of things like also in the, in the kitchen where my mom's yelling at me, I shot all that myself. So there was a whole oh, bunch yeah, of just, just cause I know there's so many filmmakers tell us what kind of point and shoot you were using and also how you were doing sound. Okay. If you're shooting so. your family in this way. I would pull it out right now. It's my little Sony with a Zeiss lens. It's a really great camera and I can actually find it while we're talking at the end, I'll pull it up. But That'd it's really, yeah, I, I actually think that a camera that looks like a phone is an ideal way to do something like that so that you don't throw your subjects off and you can be kind of subversive, really subversive about it. So, you know, for me in my own situation with my mom, I had to kind of constantly pull it out but she would yell at me often like put that away i don't want i do not want this on camera but one of the things that i started to notice was that if my dp was there and and certain dps like my amazing dp named gretchen worth and i she was just awesome and she would run after my mom and she had a rapport with her and it was one of these things where i would say okay gretchen just like ask my mom about like that row of dvds over there and then my mom would sort of perform for the camera and I wouldn't be around and I would hear her and I would deliberately run away. So part of the performance with my mom was a was a true push pull. And also Joe, um, jo, um, Cynthia, Cynthia Childs started the whole process off with me with all of the different interviews. And we were staging them. And Cynthia asked actually most of the questions. And my mom would say to me, she you know, well, you have these professional people. I can't believe they want to work with you, you know? <laughs> I'd be like, right. okay, well, and of course, she's going to try and she's going to answer them differently than she would answer no, you. No, so you. Were you off to one side watching this on like a monitor or were you just like more casually just trying to shoot whatever you could? No, sometimes I was not even able to see it. I would just like listen in with headphones. So I would go in the other room and, and we started this whole thing with um, Cynthia just asking all these questions on the couch, the, the iconic couch shot. I staged the shot. And, and for me, that was really important to get it frontal because I, I love Diane Arbus. And I, I, you know, again, this visual style, I always felt like this awkward frontal placement does something very strange to the experience of, of learning about people. So I, I just had that in my head that they have to have that one shot mm. like that. And then I ran off to the side and Cynthia asked most of the questions, but in post we, we inserted me asking the questions. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. And so it really, I'm certain they would have answered, or my mom would have answered them so much different. And, you know, I think my parents have this natural comic thing that goes on and, you know, leaning into that was part of the, experience of filming the the, mm -hmm. the whole project you know i would get something entirely different when i was there versus when the pros were doing it great yeah. um okay and then will you also um just share with everybody what you're doing next as a filmmaker well you know since covid has <laughs> disrupted this whole process of what happens next. I've actually been working on um, a few different things. One is another series that I'm excited to follow up with on. It, it's actually, it's a, it's a really strange situation that um, a crime that occurred in the area near circus of books. It was, it was a porn star, really young porn star whose murder was never solved. And it was a really gruesome crime. Yeah. And it's a really strange story that I, I became really fascinated with while I was working on Circus of Books. And it it's kind of a long process to get it developed. But I was thinking, basically, what I'm doing is putting together a, a possible series um, with Passion Pictures, the same company that actually helped do Circus of Books um, on the doc side. And it's called The Crimes of Vaseline Alley, because it's mm -hmm. actually something, you know, Vaseline Alley was, we, we hear about in the film, the kind of back area where gay culture thrived when it was a really truly underground place. And there was a lot of disengagement from the police because gay people didn't go to the police and the police also ignored the community. So there was a level of crime that could happen that was really very frightening and also a portrait of the time and what it was truly like mm. to exist in that time. So that's one project. And then 
Another, uh, of course, is my really big Gesamtkunst work, uh, you know, beautiful rock opera of sorts, The End Stage of Stars, which I've been very excitedly working with your beautiful top old folks to awesome. develop um, and potentially start on the audio side. And it's musical in form. It's a really amazing story that really takes, I would say, takes a cosmic view of our experience as humans and gender. And um, I wrote that script like five years ago and started rewriting it and developing it further. I, I wrote it with an astrophysicist and it's about black holes. Right. So, I can I can nerd out all day on all kinds of things, but yeah, we were talking about that last time we were together. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, great. Well, what about I mean, before we finish up, because I think what we were told to do about a half an hour. I'm sure we're we're getting close to that, but I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about like the promise of the title of this talk. Mm -hmm. You know, Jewish All in the Family. Yeah. Um, and just kind of thinking that made me think about Jewish all in the family. Like what if there was a Jewish all in the family, but also the <laughs> idea that like the way that Jewish families behave in terms of boundaries, like mm. if I'm making a movie, you're in it. And if you're writing something like that, mm -hmm. that you would expect your family to be in it, that your brother's story was in it, your parents, and That's that you process the success of the film and the meaning of the film, not only professionally, but also personally and emotionally and mm. with your parents and your, I mean, will you just talk about that a little bit about what that's like to kind of have everything in the same blender? Well, you know, I mean, I will say like, it's, I'm, yeah, I think you and I have this kind of commonality in some way where I, I mean, I can just feel the love that you have for your family. And I have that same love for my family. And I, of course, there's all this like mushy craziness that is like, you know, hard to figure out. Now it's figured out in public, but basically I think the film has brought my family even closer together um, because it's just been like, I, I think there was this under the surface set of things that, you know, could have easily gone un, uncreated into a doc and <laughs> unworked out in fiction, you know, in some way. But it, it, it I would say the Jewish family values that come through the film is one of the things I really do feel the most proud about um, mm. because, I, you know, I think it's a moment of reckoning in our culture right now with all of our different cultural identities. And, you know, especially right now, I think Jewish culture can be really like thrown into a tailspin. We have all kinds of massive differences, political and otherwise. Mm. So I just feel like a fundamental through line that is this like overwhelming amount of like really extreme love that exists somehow above it all has been what I, I feel um, mm. in my film. I don't know. And I, I feel that in, in your, you know, I found the same thing actually, that actually having the document of the show really allowed us to kind of like move forward as a family by having a lot of things articulated that may never have, have become articulated. That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, that's what is so, I, I think that's exactly why I, I, you know, found your show like to be this cathartic thing for me as well. Like, wow, someone else is, she, you know, this has been worked out. It was so fascinating. Um, you know, and I think that that lack of resolution on some stuff is also okay. We recognize it like, okay, it's been you know, these are the things that are worked out and these things are, you know, in flux. Yeah, the lack of resolution. Totally. The question. The question is oh so very Jewish, right? Just to be in the place of the question. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. Um yeah, and I I mean I do think actually Jews dive into questions in a particularly useful way. We're we're often like struggling with that, but like aware that the dialogue is gonna continue. That doesn't yeah. have to be resolved. Yeah, the muck, like to be able to not have to get somewhere, but the getting somewhere is the goal. Well, um, yeah. this is not related to that, but it's just something I was thinking about and thinking about maybe um, the people listening might want to hear, or people watching might want to hear. So we talked about the sort of relationship you have with Netflix and the, like, I call it the awards industrial complex, everything that's like going on around getting you an award. And I feel mm -hmm. like I saw something recently that was like, the phrase like not supported by like there was a press thing that made it seem like Netflix wasn't supporting it. And I do know that like from my behind the scenes stuff at um, Amazon, you know, there'd be like, okay, this is, these are the people we're promoting for these, the best actress, not promoting, but just kind of like focusing on like, okay, we're really trying to get Judith light it. 
nomination, that there were these kinds of ways in which things happen behind the scenes around awards. Tell me about what's going on there with you and Netflix. Well, you know, I think one of the things that was the initial conversation was that this was going to be a film that would lean more heavily towards an Emmy award. And, and we got Emmy nominated, which is unbelievable. And so I think on the side of like, I, I learned entirely all of this in the last year, learning about TV and film. I didn't know, but apparently TV and film are in separate sides of the universe and they never come together mm -hmm. ever. So it was this idea that like, okay, well, if you're going to um, get a Oscar or an Emmy, you can't also get an Oscar. And I didn't know any of these things, but I just had thought, actually for me, my goal was to get this thing made. And then I got it made and it was like, okay, maybe if it gets into Outfest and the LGBT film festivals, that'll be cool. And then, you know, I'm always one of those people that when somebody says you can't do something, I'm like, wait, why? No, okay, so that was when I realized it was this thing like, okay, well, we're aiming you towards Emmys and that means you can't do an Oscar. And then I learned of, you know, other films that had, had that exact path. And I said, well, well, that film over there, did both and you know why can't we and so i had this feeling of like fighting for the film and so wait a minute what you're saying is like you actually can try to get an emmy and an oscar in the same year or with yeah. the same film but it's just not it's frowned upon yeah it's frowned okay. upon and now they're sort of changing the rules but in this exact year right now we're still totally able to do it so i just had this thought because you know, I'm the ultimate underdog. I mean, to, to have a film that has porn in it is really like this thing that still is just um, mm -hmm. very difficult. And I, I understand that right off the bat. It's 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 got the stigma of porn. And, and yet that's actually what made me fight so hard because in this last year, literally we were writing, me and Buck, to fill out COVID applications. And, it, and there's a actual line the Trump administration put in there to eliminate sex workers, anyone in the sex field. So I'm like, wait, uh, how many years have you paid taxes? And he's, you know, and, and my parents and all the people who currently pay taxes who work in sex are ineligible for COVID relief. So I suddenly thought, wow. okay, well, I, you know, Netflix fights many battles. And actually, I, I can't thank them enough for all the battles they fight on behalf of LGBT people. But one of my personal battles is the battle to make sure people in the sex industry are treated fairly. Yeah. So it doesn't matter to me that, you know, Netflix may have all their different reasons for, I think they support films they really believe will win. And I think that's the logic of it because that makes sense. You know, really they have to look out for that idea. I'm sure Amazon or anywhere else is like, well, we just have to go with what's going to win. Like it's just a, a monopoly game. So I think because we are in the porn sphere, you know, society is not quite ready to push anything that has sex so upfront, no matter that LGBT, I think is something that they feel very worthy of pushing. And they might very well feel the same way about the sex industry. But I think that is the ultimate um, difficulty of a film like ours is that we have sort of two really hard um, spheres to promote. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad you're doing it. And um, when are the Oscars? Like what happens? Do people, nobody's going, it's going to be the same as the Emmys, right? Where somebody shows up at somebody's door. Is that how it works? Oh my God. I have, I mean, yeah, they're still trying to figure it out, but I think I, I would imagine they're going to have to be remote by now. Yeah. What a world. Yeah. Crazy. Be there. Yeah. And I do want to shout out, actually, I'm really proud of Netflix for supporting, um, um, disclosure, which I was really glad. To, I will have to say, I was really glad to see there was some great support for transparent in disclosure. And I was, I was also going to say, I, I would have hoped to see you in that film, but were you interviewed for that or? No, I don't. Yeah. It was a kind of different, maybe different group of people. And, uh, and who knows, you know, that everybody's but, making yeah, their movies, you... not necessarily like pulling everybody in all the time but well yeah every film can't include everyone but i i feel strongly that netflix is supporting a, a good solid lgbt doc and they did a great job with that film um yeah, you know i movie. also i wish buck was in it too <laughs> but i was glad. right yeah but yeah why didn't buck, that's a great question well yeah everybody can't be in everything you right know? everyone can't be in everything no yeah. but i i mean i have to say i just was like okay the fact that transparent i think changed the entire world 
<laughs> really just changed the world um, for trans people. And me and Buck were sitting there like, woo, right when we got to the spot where they talked about your film. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, Thanks, it mattered Rachel. a lot. So. You know, we're we're always out here trying, always yeah. hustling, trying to make uh make the world a safer place, a for better our, place. All of our beloved, our trans, our trans family, our Jewish family, uh, you know, oh. watching the way that white supremacy is being um seen now, finally, and everything that goes along with it, you know, the patriarchy, the misogyny, you know, everything that goes with white supremacy, I think is is um totally. I think I think there's a new world coming. I hope there is anyway. Kamala, people like you telling great stories. Kamala, I, I was gonna just say, I, I am I, to me that that's like the shining hope is just yeah. to finally see a woman of color in that spot. Yeah, I think a year from now things could be like so different that we can't even imagine. I'm, I'm, yeah, let's hope. I'm hopeful. And pray. <laughs> and, and yeah, hope and pray. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. It's so great to talk to you. I hope oh, totally. before long we're all vaccinated and we're all hugging and, and seeing each other oh, really? again, again and again. Oh, totally. All right. A bright future. Yes. Okay. Thank you both for joining us again, for sharing your stories on screen, for sharing your voices here. Um, and I echo, of course, it's like wonderful future with Kamala as well. So um, so I want to thank you all for once Thanks again. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Thanks. And there, everyone, you know, already seen Circus of Books and of course a lot of Joey's work as well. Please re-watch it um, and tell all of your friends to go uh, seek out Circus of Books on Netflix if you haven't already seen it or if you want to watch sure. it. Yeah. Um, awesome. All right. Thank you. Talk soon, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye.